see today's topic is carcinoma esophagus or cancer of esophagus it's so let's start so my uh, lecture will be very brief on these subheadings introduction in epidemiology anatomy and histology natural history and patterns risk factors neoplasm of esophagus genetic alterations uh, etiology clinical work of staging surveillance i may skip a few if i feel it's getting too didactic or a little boring but trust me for you uh, you don't need to know this topic in so much of detail you should just know what are the basic tenets of treatment of ca esophagus and that it is a treatable disease if presented within if it's presented up to stage 3 it's a treatable disease it's a curable disease so it's the uh, one of the most common malignancy seven most common in the world fifth most common in india and uh, Uh, male to female, it's more common in males. Adeno uh, squamous cell carcinoma is the most common, more common form than adeno carcinoma. Squamous cell in India, you will get to see more of squamous cell carcinoma as compared to the Western world, because uh, where they get to see adeno carcinoma, which is uh, due mainly due to obesity and uh, parents' esophagus. So uh, usually the disease is seen in six to seven decade or six to eight decade, and mostly in mid and lower esophagus. now one more thing i want to tell you if you look at the world map uh, india has three endemic portions for ca esophagus one is kashmir one is northeast one is kerala but what you see in kerala it's the upper third of esophagus not middle or lower third post required and upper third Be because of what they call patterson kelly uh, patterson uh, kelly syndrome or that plumber wenzel syndrome in the upper third of esophagus whereas in kashmir you'll get to see a lot of middle third northeast you'll get to see a lot of, lot of middle third if you take the same latitude uh, of kashmir that is if you uh, take it along china and go towards pakistan iraq so that forms the esophageal cancer belt of the world the where you in that latitude in that range of latitude you get to see maximum esophageal cancers what are the causes of these cancers in this region which we'll discuss a little later then uh, applied anatomy of esophagus i'll just want to tell you that see how the esophagus is divided in upper lower and middle third cervical esophagus is basically up to 18 cm from the incisors or you can say uh, it's the cricopharynx where the cricopharynx starts from cricopharynx to thoracic inlet then the upper esophagus uh, it's up to the carina middle esophagus from carina to inferior pulmonary vein and lower esophagus from inferior pulmonary vein to esophageal gastric junction and corresponding uh, measurements in centimeters are written by this side which is which are done on endoscopy So now, will anybody tell me why do we have these two different uh, types of classifying uh, uh, the, the upper, middle, and lower third of the esophagus? So basically, it is uh, these centimeters are on endoscopy. See, the measurements in endoscopy may change with the person's height. If there's a shorter person, maybe you will get a middle third or lower third esophagus at 25 centimeters only, just because the patient is short. whereas the other ones with the anatomical landmarks are these are landmarks on a ct scan so you know no matter doesn't matter if the patient is tall or short those landmarks will remain static so upper middle lower it's very important to know where the tumor is located it helps us to take treatment decisions other than that esophagus has a segmental blood supply it doesn't have an axial blood supply that is very very important uh, but it's a very important uh, uh, point in the anatomy which helps Uh, in the type of anastomosis do you do or how you uh, carry on the surgery then mesial plexus is very thinly spread out it has longitudinal lymphatics in the submucosa scc account for as i said of the 40% of the patients and uh, 40% of the malignancies and 60% of which are located in the middle third you will find 40% uh, uh, of uh, squamous cell carcinomas not 40% somewhere between 20 to 30% in the lower third also and of course in the upper third but it's very 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 rare to find adeno carcinoma in the middle third Squam small cell carcinoma is a very rare type but is often seen in middle and lower third now natural history and pattern of the disease uh, now why why it becomes such a lethal disease what is the problem with uh, ca esophagus as compared to stomach cancer or any other cancer why is it considered bad prognosis the two anatomical reasons for it that the disease lacks a serosa the i mean the organ lacks a serosa so it lacks serosa it has what it has is adventitia which is just thickening of the surrounding tissue and second thing is it has a very rich lymphatic submucosal lymphatics 
which helps in spread of the disease either way from lower third to upper third from or from upper third to lower third so that is a very important uh, aspect of the anatomy clinical aspect of the anatomy then it drains it as the esophagus traverses it drains into uh, the nearby lymph node stations like the cervical esophagus will drain in neck and upper mediastinal nodes middle esophagus will drain in subcranial nodes paraesophageal nodes lower will drain into uh, peridiaphragmatic nodes celiac plexus and the abdominal nodes so where it wherever the esophagus is traversing from there the nodal station is there this is also because it has a segmental blood supply not a actual blood supply suppose it had an actual blood supply then it would drain to one particular region from where the axis is originating but because it has a segmental blood supply all different parts of the esophagus drain into different segments or different areas of lymph nodes in the neck mediastinum and the upper abdomen this again this picture you would have seen in stomach cancer this is classification morphological classification of uh, esophageal cancer it's almost similar to what you see in the stomach cancer this is a japanese classification and on my right is the lymph node stations again it's it's a little complicated for you i just suppose you i mean you sh- you're not required to know it but you should know there is some japanese uh, way of classifying the lymph nodes of uh, esophage esophagus now as i said there are various neoplasms right from squamous cell carcinoma they can be sarcoma carcinoma sarcoma adenocarcinoma mucopidoma adenoids it's a small cell and non epithelial can be leiomyoma leiomyosarcoma rhabdomyosarcoma i mean there are various varieties but the most common you see in our country is squamous cell carcinoma and after that is adenocarcinoma squamous cell mostly 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 occurs in the middle third and part of it is in the lower third whereas adenocarcinoma is nearly always seen in lower third of cancer lower third is affected now these are common genetic alterations a lot of people have suggested that it has a genetic uh, predisposition but no uh, confirmed uh, syndromes there are like bloom syndrome and fanken syndrome which can lead to squamous cell cancers but still uh, a more uh, strong association is, needs to be determined now what are the causes cigarette smoking as any other squamous cell cancer in the body cigarette smoking with alcohol increases the chances when they taken simultaneously then diet nitrosamines in diet obesity low socio economic status uh decrease microvitamins or micronutrients deficiency these deficiencies also lead to ca esophagus uh what you should also know is grd as i said barrett's esophagus then uh tylosis this is uh palmo plantar hyperkeratosis has a high chance of developing middle third cancers that is specially squamous then apart from this achalasia cardia patients of achalasia cardia have predisposition for developing squamous cell cancers later in their life roughly 17 to 20 years similarly acid ingestion or caustic injury patients have this plummer vinson or patterson kelly syndrome that's for upper esophagus not for middle or lower third and now it's been suggested that few subtypes of hpv have also been known to cause ca esophagus so this was the etiology now clinical features the most common feature you see is dysphagia that's why the the disease is usually picked up early mainly in the second or the third stage where patient complains of dysphagia to solids which becomes dysphagia to liquids because of dysphagia or unable to eat there is weight loss then vomiting sometimes there is pain when the disease is gone outside the adventitia and has involved the surrounding nerve plexus the cough for hoarseness of voice usually seen in the upper third tumors when it has re- involved the recurrent laryngeal nerves and sometimes dyspnea when the patient develops has there's compression on trachea or there's a tracheostomy fistula usually cough hoarseness of voice or dyspnea are very advanced symptoms pain is also advanced symptom usually patient presents with dysphagia and weight loss now work up and staging usually the you'll find a thin lean patient who is looking a little cachectic that's the ideal uh, appearance of a is a carcinoma esophagus patient patient will complain that he's he's got dysphagia or is unable to eat so whenever you suspect uh, ca esophagus in a patient first thing you need to get is upper gi endoscopy with of course if a growth is seen in that it should be biopsied and a contrast enhanced ct scan for uh, thorax and the upper abdomen i mean throughout the course of of the esophagus fdg pet is not mandatory as a part of uh, metastatic workup but because of ease of availability nowadays it's been very rampantly used it's also seen one of the studies from uh, india itself it showed that 
it it alters the treatment in 12% of the patients that means where the ct is saying a particular thing about the disease it might upstage or downstage the disease by 12% i mean there's 12% variations in the results when you get a fdg pet done or a ct done but still it's not become the standard of care then of course you have to get the blood profile done of the patient endoscopic ultrasound is the best staging tool for best tool for staging for t stage of the disease so what are the indications of doing a endoscopic ultrasound Firstly, it's when the disease is very, very early, where you know you don't have to give new adjuvant treatment and you can upfront operate. That's when you get it done. Endoscopic ultrasound or the disease is very advanced. It's involving the surrounding structures and you want to know if it's involving for sure that it's involving any surrounding structure. That's when you get it done. So it's the best modality for T staging of the disease, not for N or M. And then endoscopic resection for early stage cancers but uh, i mean i won't call it as a part of workup but yeah in lot of uh, lot of centers are doing this nowadays uh, one more point i would say that barium swallow is outdated for doing it in ci esophagus now now i mean it was done previously but with better endoscopy techniques and everything it doesn't tell us anything more than uh, upper gi endoscopy what upper gi endoscopy tells us other than that the problem with barium meal or barium uh, swallow is that barium stays in the gi tract for quite some time and you are unable to do a ct scan because it produces a foreign body artifact so barium is usually not done nowadays for ca so because it's it's a redundant investigation uh, then of course biopsy testing you have to get biopsy as said adeno or squamous it will change the line of management and you have to definitely know if whether it is met, disease metastatic or localized metastatic has a different way of management localized has a different way of management her two testing is usually done in metastatic adenocarcinoma it's shown that if these patients are given herceptin they have a survival benefit of about 2 to 3 months not much but this is all very advanced for you you just you should know that this is being done nothing more than that if you don't even know this it's okay bronchoscopy is usually done in the middle third tumors because esophagus is in close contact with the trachea so sometimes middle esophageal tumors they invade into the posterior membranous wall of trachea so you have to do the bronchoscopy in middle third tumors to know if the trachea is freely mobile the posterior wall is freely mobile or it's involved then after that there should be nutritional assessment of the patient because patients are usually cachectic they have not been able to eat for a very long time and if the patient it's a lot of these patients are smokers and if you are contemplating surgery then they should be asked to quit smoking there's a picture of an endoscopic ultrasound the innermost layer is the mucosa the outermost layer is the adventitia and then those two big balls this, this these are the surrounding structures like aorta and this is the trachea this is the trachea you see and this is the aorta this is the tnm staging again uh, so t1 is involvement of t1 a is involvement of the mucosa t1 b submucosa t2 muscularis propria t3 adventitia t4 a t4 b are surrounding structures is T4A is like visceral para, uh, parietal pericardium, uh, yeah, parietal pericardium, esophageal vein, diaphragm, peritoneum. Whereas T4B will be is unresectable disease uh, where the structures are involved, which cannot be removed during surgery, like aorta, vertebral body, or airway. Now, now the AJCC has changed to number of nodes in the end staging. Previously, it used to be the location, so it's like one to two, one or two nodes, two, three to six, and seven or more nodes. Previously, it used to be uh, one thing you should you people should note that supraclavicular node is not does not mean esophageal cancer becomes metastatic is that clear that's a very important point if a uh, esophageal cancer comes to you with supraclavicular node it is not metastatic it's a regional disease so this was about the staging then it's like m1 and m0 and m1 is uh, staging of the disease and g1 g2 g3 is well differentiated poorly different uh, moderately differentiated and poorly differentiated so now there is different stage grouping for uh, for adeno and squamous it's a little complicated i'm so i'm skipping these slides and you also don't need to memorize these so another important classification is the sievert's classification the picture is not quite correct but i'll just quickly explain to you sievert type 1 is where the epicenter of the disease is at the g junction or within 2 cm of the g junction and extending upward the esophagus up to 5 cm that is sievert's 1 sievert's 2 is epicenter is at the g junction and it's uh, extending 5 cm both ways like you know the whole extent is 5 centimeters but the epicenter is at the g junction and sieverts 3 is uh, again the epicenter is at the g junction or majority of the disease is lying 4 cent 5 centimeters below the g junction one thing you should remember sieverts classification is 
uh, a disease is classified according to Siebert's classification only on endoscopy, that is one. And secondly, it's only for adenocarcinomas. It's not for squamous carcinomas. It's a very important point that all, you, all of you should remember. Then management, it's like surgical reception, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and other combinations of the three. But more or less, if you get a very early disease, T1 disease, of course, surgery is the treatment of choice and then nothing else needs to be done. But if you get T2 or T3 disease or stage 2 or stage 3 disease, first thing is standard of care in esophagus today is new adjuvant chemotherapy, uh, new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy. So you have to first give a little amount of chemotherapy, little amount of radiotherapy so that the disease shrinks and it becomes more amenable to surgery and then you go ahead and operate. There are other the treatment for uh, adenoma squamous cell, car cell carcinoma also differ in terms of new adjuvant chemotherapy uh, in adenocarcinoma you can only give new adjuvant chemotherapy or what is called perioperative chemotherapy that means you give some chemotherapy to uh, initially then you operate and then you give some more chemotherapy in squamous cell carcinoma usually you give chemo radiation first and then you operate and then do nothing about it and in adenocarcinoma again you can also give chemo radiotherapy and then do nothing after the surgery so you know there are different permutation and combination but what you should know that higher stage like stage 2 and stage 3 surgical cancer you have to give some kind of new adjuvant treatment preferably new adjuvant chemo radiotherapy followed by surgery that's the standard uh, line of management so what are the surgical approaches Ivor Lewis Mekions transital so Ivor Lewis is you keep a midline abdominal incision and you keep a right side thoracotomy. You start with the abdomen first, mobilize the stomach, put it up in the thorax and then open the thorax and take the stomach tube up, excise the tumor, take the stomach tube up and do the anastomosis. Whereas in Mekions, Mekions is also called three stage. So why is it three stage? Because you keep an incision in neck, thorax and abdomen. So first you start with the thorax, mobilize the disease, then you open the abdomen, then mobilize the stomach and then you open the neck where you disconnect. Uh, the esophagus from the neck and you have already disconnected in the abdomen so you take out the esophagus and take the stomach up and do the anastomosis in the neck. Transhital is a bl blind procedure where you keep two incisions one in the neck one in the abdomen you mobilize the stomach blindly put your hand in the mediastinum bluntly dissect the esophagus right till the neck and then do the neck cut the esophagus there take the stomach uh, take the esophagus down make a stomach tube and do the anastomosis in the neck. Which is better right now, no approach is proven to be better than the any, any other approach. It's mainly dependent on the surgeon's comfort. Nowadays, minimally invasive uh, esophagectomy and of course robotic esophagectomy all have come in. The basic advantage they have is lesser chance of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury and of course less mor morbidity for the patient. Uh, usually patients in our own setup we've seen uh, at IMS that when you do an open esophagectomy, a patient usually gets discharged by 12 or 13 days or maybe 14, 15 days. Whereas when you do a uh, thoracoscopic dissection, usually by 10, 9th or 10th, the patient goes home. So that much uh, uh, patient, there is definitely less morbidity, less pulmonary complications, less chance of rectal laryngeal nerve injuries because the view is that many times more magnified in thoracoscopy. Anastomosis has different techniques, end to side, side to side, stapled, hand soon, but none has proven better than the other and can be done either way. Choice of gastric condo, usually the workhorse of the gastric condo of, uh, the condo of choice is the stomach, but if the stomach is unavailable due to any which reason or the surgery has complicated and the stomach tube has necros, then of course colon becomes the uh, condo of choice. It could be the be right colon or left colon, that depends on the surgeon's preference. You can see this is how the stomach tube is made. It is just cut like this and this tube is put up in the neck and with the colon this what they have shown is the left colon and it goes up in the neck like that. So this incision which you see is this is the thoracotomy incision and this is laparotomy and this is the neck. What are the complications of the surgery? You can have hemorrhage, respiratory tract infection because chest is open. Some, some surgeons prefer a double human tube. The skylothorax, there could be leak in the anastomosis, host enough voice because of injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, stricture, gastric esophageal uh, reflux, conduit necrosis, it's almost fatal, conduit necrosis. Chances are less than 1%, but it's almost fatal. Colonic dysmobility due to partial obstruction in colonic transplant. Roughly, the surgery has approximately 5% mortality. Endoscopic therapies are done for very early disease, usually. Uh, uh, very early T1A diseases, um, the I mean, 
the options we have is endoscopic mucosal resection and endos uh, endoscopic ablations, cryo ablations, RFA. The others also available. When the disease is unresectable, the options you are left with is either palliative radiation to open up the obstruction, stenting that is self-expanding metal stenting, insertion of Riles tube or a desojejunal tube. So these are the options available when uh, when we uh, when we have a patient in a metastatic setting. Usually, whenever we have a patient metastatic setting or unresectable, we should prefer radiating the patient first and then stenting because then you can utilize both the options. A lot of radiation oncolo oncologists do not uh, radiate the stented patients. So if you keep the sequence correct, you can take ma you can take maximum advantage in patient's benefit. Uh, there's, there's not much role of adjuvant radiation that is after surgery, the role of radiation is limited only if there's extra capsular spread of the disease. Otherwise, it's usually not advisable. Intraluminal brachytherapy is again for to treat dysphagia. It's a type of palliative radiotherapy. Systemic, systemic therapy again in adjuvant setting only in adenocarcinoma and palliative setting doesn't have much role. It has shown to improve progression free survival, but not overall survival. Early stage esophageal cancer and even like up to stage three, stage one, stage two, stage three is a curable disease. It's not that it's not curable. Patient should meet the right person, get operated, take chemo radiotherapy. There are chances that he will, I mean, uh, patient will get cured. Stage four, of course, it's not acceptable and not possible. Survival in stage three surfaces is close to 40 to 45 percent at five years. So it's a risk worth taking. I mean, patient should be referred for treatment, should be given treatment. Thank you.